Thank you, everyone, and we're so honored and pleased to have you with us. Well, thank President you very Laura. much, Laura, and it, it's uh, so great to be here with Laura and Orville Schell and Dan Weiss, and I've seen just walking this <laughs> way uh, eight or nine really close friends, and I'm sure there are many others I uh, should single out, but what an amazing, <laughs> amazing right. what an amazing event. Thank you for asking me to be a part of it. You're making it even more amazing. So we're going to get right to the questions. Um, and I want to start with a quote of yours, which I particularly like. Uh, you say that we're on a seismic shift. We're on the edge of a sustainability revolution. That's right. great news. Magnitude of the industrial revolution. That's how transformative. And with the speed of the digital revolution. Yeah. So this is a very optimistic statement. Yeah. And you are an optimist um, about what's happening. And I want to start with what are the main reasons you are optimistic? Um, what are the trends? What are the things that you look at and say, you know, we really are in a sustainability revolution? Yeah, well, first, anybody who uh, deals with the climate crisis, and so many of you here have been dealing with it for quite a while, uh, but any of us who get involved uh, occasionally have a struggle between hope and despair. I will admit that openly. I, but I always do come down on the side of hope. And I think the evidence uh, justifying that hope is, is overwhelming now. The sustainability revolution, magnitude of industrial speed of the digital, is based on uh, many of the new digital tools that are now available. Uh, with machine learning and artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, uh, precision uh, machining, uh, uh, computational science and digital science uh, in many different varieties. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one quick example from the Bay Area. Um, two guys from uh, London, Demis Asibis and Mustafa Suleiman, started... Mm -hmm. uh, right. Deep Mind, Deep Mind, which many, including me, regard as the uh, best artificial intelligence mm -hmm. uh, company in the world. Um, and after they were bought by Alphabet slash Google, a few years passed, and Google asked them to examine the energy use in their server farms, the biggest server farms of any company in the world. And without any new hardware, but just with the application of artificial intelligence to, it must be added, highly structured data that had been collected painstakingly over a long period of time, uh, they were able to reduce the energy use by 56%. Increased output of process information, no hardware changes, just uh, more intelligent management of the electrons and BTUs. Mm -hmm. Essentially, and, and there are tens of thousands of use cases where this can be applied, mm -hmm. and so it is beginning to be applied elsewhere. <clears throat> I'll let them tell their story about the other examples that are not public yet. But basically, many executive teams are now acquiring the ability to manage um, electrons, atoms, molecules with the same precision the IT companies have used mm -hmm. in managing bits of Okay. information. Mm -hmm. We've seen demand destruction in energy use begin to accelerate. You okay. can look at the same thing. Amory Lovins, I think, is going to be around here uh, this week. Mm -hmm. and uh, he, he, uh, I've always learned a lot from Amory, if, if I can absorb it as fast as he puts <laughs> it out. Um, but but um, um, he, he, he gives uh, many examples mm -hmm. uh, of the same exact thing um, uh, happening with uh, the, the management of energy demand. Uh, and of course, we, another cause for optimism is that the same uh, radical uh, cost reduction curves that we, many of us first became aware of with Moore's Law and computer right. chips, now with sequencing, it's coming down eight times faster than Moore's Law. Uh, and there are lots and lots of these uh, cost reduction curves that reflect the sustainability revolution. Uh, and, and, and what we're seeing uh, is hyper-efficiency, new business models, the kind of disruption that came with the digital revolution we're now seeing uh, 
in the physical world. Okay. I think you also talk about the extent to which everything, the, the pace of technological change, which we can see in the digital world, has been faster than expected. Even if you look at things like what's happened in the solar energy space and, and to the, what's happened to the price of solar, or what's happened to the price of wind, so that faster than people expected, those price shifts have occurred. Is that, is, is that part of the optimism? Yeah, absolutely. The, these cost reduction curves are perhaps most visible uh, with renewable energy. 18 years ago, the best projections for wind energy were that the world would be able to install 30 gigawatts by 2010. We've now beaten that uh, goal by 18 times over. Mm -hmm. uh, 16 years ago, the best projections were on solar that the world would be able to install one gigawatt per year by 2010. When 2010 arrived, they beat that goal by 17 times over. Last year, they beat it 98 times over. Uh, and th this exponential curve is still uh, getting steeper and steeper and moving up faster uh, and faster, the number of PV uh, uh, cells installed. Uh, the cost has been coming down dramatically. Uh, Already here in the United States, there are five times as many jobs in solar as in yes. coal. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, fa the single, fa according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the single fastest growing job in America uh, is solar installer. It's growing nine times <laughs> faster uh -huh. than, than average job growth. Second fastest growing job is uh, wind turbine technician. Really? Really? Uh, the famous uh, uh, coal Museum in Kentucky uh, just installed solar panels on its roof uh, to, to, uh, Coal and to, save, ice. to save money. They did not put out a press release, but um, true story. Uh, um, emerging markets, that was discussed a little bit in the morning session, and of course we're going to have a big delegation of uh, people from around the world during the global summit. Yeah. Emerging markets and the ability to leapfrog, what about that as a source of optimism? Or are you just concerned that actually if you take a country like India, massive population growth, massive need to build out the electricity uh, sort of delivery system, will that be carbon-based or not. So what about the, the mm. emerging markets and the optimism that you might have for leapfrogging to new technologies? Yeah. <clears throat> well, the analogy that I have often used, I think, is uh, a way of understanding how this works, and that is to cell phones. Uh, in 1980, um, AT&T asked McKinsey to estimate <laughs> how many of those first-generation cell phones they could sell by 2000. And the answer came 900,000. When, when, <laughs> when the year 2000 arrived, they did sell 900,000 of them in the, in the first three days of the year. Uh, and for the year as a whole, 120 times McKinsey that. must hate this. <laughs> and, and, and there were three reasons why they were way wrong. Way wrong. The, the cost came down much faster than anyone expected, even as the, mm -hmm. the technology improved uh, dramatically. There will be another round of improvements. I he read in the press, at least, that Apple has another announcement tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, but the third reason for this huge uh, uh, explosion in the use of mobile phones is that the, the, the majority of the people uh, in, in the world lived in areas that had no landline telephone grids, so they leapfrogged. And now you have places in East Africa, for example, that make much uh, more intensive use of banking by mm -hmm. phone and all kinds of services uh, by phone. A co company, M. Copen, has sold 500,000 uh, uh, DC uh, solar powered television sets uh, out in villages that have no electricity, no electricity grid. So, yes, the leapfrog phenomena for, and let's take the example of India, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, they're getting bids uh, this, this, this summer mm -hmm. um, uh, for electricity from solar at a, a cost nearly half, barely half, of electricity from coal. Mm -hmm. They now have under construction 225 gigawatts of renewable energy. Now, the coal industry there, as here, still has political advocates. Political advocates, and, right. Uh, the fossil fuel uh, uh, companies uh, 
have for 100 years built up a, a network of political uh, support and embedded themselves in a lot of economic uh, structures. And it's always thus, the legacy companies try to stave off the, uh, the shift from, uh, toward new uh, challengers. But the cost uh, differential is j just continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So there, it, it's only a matter of time. But time is crucial. Time is crucial. Uh, and just to circle back briefly to your point about optimism, mm -hmm. uh, we, we are still uh, n not winning. Right. Uh, we, are, w we are gaining momentum okay. with renewable energy, not only a renewable energy, but batteries, mm -hmm. electric vehicles, mm -hmm. uh, and a, a sustainable agriculture, sustainable forestry, mm -hmm. um, uh, manufacturing uh, that is beginning to figure out ways to adopt a circular economy uh, approach. Uh, but we have to scale up uh, this effort dramatically. It, it is a global emergency. People hear a phrase like that and it sounds a little uh, hair on fire hyper, but uh, this is an existential threat to the future of human civilization. Most of you here, um, maybe not all, but most really know that, but, but adopting that as a, a, a guiding uh, understanding of the reality we're facing is, is absolutely essential now. We have to make the decarbonization of the global economy the central organizing principle of human civilization in order to stave off the climate crisis in time to avoid the truly catastrophic consequences. So what percent, this uh, gets me to obviously the question about um, the role of U.S. leadership in all of this because this room and uh, many, most of the people attending the conference this week or the conferences this week in San Francisco are convinced it's a, national, it's a global emergency. Yeah. But uh, U.S. policy at the federal level right now is certainly not uh, being made by anyone who believes that. Yeah. Uh, or if they believe it, they're not saying it. <laughs> they're keeping quiet. Well, they're the ones uh, that are taking a few <laughs> papers off his desk. And, uh, right, right. That. Those people are taking a few papers. All yeah. right. So I'm going to go to the Paris Accord and ask you, so what do you think <clears throat> the implications of a lack of federal U.S. leadership are for getting the other countries of the world to adhere to the Paris Accord uh, commitments. If everyone came to the table believing in the emergency, but now the U.S. has left, we yeah. don't believe in the emergency anymore, what about the rest of the world? Yeah. Well, I was uh, deeply concerned when uh, Donald Trump made his uh, speech a year ago last spring uh, that other countries would use his uh, decision as an excuse to leave themselves. But no one else has, has mm -hmm. left. Mm -hmm. In fact, the two holdouts, uh, Nicaragua and Syria, uh, joined, and now all 195 nations in the world uh, are uh, committed to going to zero greenhouse uh, pollution by mid-century. By mid-century. And, and yes, Donald Trump made the speech, but what many people do not yet know is that under the law, and we are still a, a nation under the law as of uh, uh, <laughs> this afternoon, and I think we will remain so, but under the law, the first day that the United States of America could actually leave right. the Paris Agreement mm -hmm. is the day after the next presidential the next election. election. So that's a good thing. Uh, and. <laughs> And um, under the terms of the treaty, if there is a new uh, president, excuse me for a moment, then um, <laughs> a new president could give uh, 30 days notice and we're right back in the Paris Agreement. S uh, second point uh, in response to your mm -hmm. question, Laura. Um, technological business and investing uh, realities are now driving this transition we could move considerably faster, uh, which we need to do, if we had the kind of leadership at the federal level that we have here in the state of California. Thank you, Jerry Brown, for signing that bill yesterday.
And, you know, uh, a, a little known fact, which is an irrelevant fact because it, it doesn't, we can't actually do it, but if we could magically stop putting man made global warming pollution into the atmosphere uh, tomorrow, mm -hmm. how long would it take for 50% of the CO2 to mm -hmm. fall back out of the atmosphere? The answer is kind of surprising, a single generation, around uh, wow. 25 years. Now, we can't do that, but no. that, that reality is one that should be a source of it's some inspiration. hope. Because, mm -hmm. um, uh, who was our, our friend, the economist, in the last uh, century who, uh, who said, uh, things take longer to happen than you think they will? and then they happen much faster than you thought they could. I'm not sure. Rudy, Rudy Dornbush. Oh, Rudy Dornbush. Dornbush. Uh, Dornbush. It was this century. I mean, last century. You're right. We're in the 20th. I lose said track of centuries. And you, and yes. He was last century. It's easy to do. We're, <laughs> That's there are correct. a lot of distractions going on. <laughs> uh, but, but that pattern... That pattern is one that we have seen out, particularly seen play out, particularly in the technology space. Uh, there, you know, uh, take uh, the importance of sustainable agriculture, for example. Okay, right, very important. Uh, if we could really gain momentum and speed in transforming agriculture from industrial models and factory farming uh, to the kind of agricultural techniques that don't strip mine soil carbon but actually re replenish it, we could actually, that's the best chance, along with planting trees, but uh, the, the topsoils of the world have three and a half times as much carbon as all the trees and the vegetation put together. And if we began to uh, sequester soil carbon with sensible agricultural techniques, that's one example of how we, we could actually uh, gain on this problem. But the main thing is we have to stop burning fossil fuels as quickly as possible. And by the way, that means natural gas also. also. It is not a bridge yep. to the future as we once thought. Even uh, among uh, environmentalists, there is still uh, um, a, a current idea that mm -hmm. this is kind of a transition right. fuel. Um, uh, and, and there's some evidence that in some places, uh, yes, but the problem is methane leaks. It leaks from pipelines, it leaks from compressors, and most of all, it leaks from fracking gas wells, which cause all kinds of other problems and makes water scarcity worse. And there is this massive cycle, uh, cycle of investment now building out new natural gas pipeline networks, uh, and that's an opportunity cost for the deployment of capital that ought to be going to uh, renewables and the other aspects of the sustainability revolution. If we begin to, if we had the kind of leadership that we need, we could move a lot faster. But in the meantime, thanks to California, uh, 15 other states, right. lots of cities, lots and, of cities. In, 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 including uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, uh, New York, uh, many others, uh, w the U.S. is going to meet its uh, commitments under the Paris Agreement and exceed them. China and India are on track to way overachieve, it's, it's but um, all of those commitments put together are still not enough. They're not enough. They're not, not enough. Right. But but they but they form a foundation of commitment that we can build on, particularly as this sustainability revolution gains force and speed, and as these cost reduction curves continue uh, to to plummet. So let me ask a question about the 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 carbon-based fuel, that really relates to uh, the point that um, overall, these are heavily subsidized yeah. fuels. And around the world, it seems that there may be going on some reduction in the subsidies that are available to alternatives, while we continue to have a large subsidy uh, for carbon-based fuels. Yeah. I mean, another way to put that, and you've written about this too, is the subsidy is partly because, partly reflects the fact that if we actually charged the carbon-based fuels for the externality, if we actually charged them for the, the waste they're putting into the, the atmosphere, yeah. it, they would be much more expensive. Do, are you worried that, uh, or do you, 
I guess related to this, you're, you talked at lunch about the overinvestment th that's going on in yeah. carbon-based because there's still a lot of subsidies for th yeah. this activity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you look at it on a global basis, uh, taxpayers around the world are being required to subsidize the burning of fossil fuels at a rate 38 times greater than the meager subsidies for renewable energy. Uh, in the U.S., it, it's not as bad as that. I think it's 24 times <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> uh, as much. And, and this is, of course, manifestly uh, ab absurd. Mm -hmm. uh, and and if, you, if you look at... Well, we're, we're treating the atmosphere as an open sewer. Sewer, yes. Sewer and, and, of course, as, as most people realize, the atmosphere... The sky is not a vast and limitless expanse. It's an extremely narrow shell surrounding the planet. And we're putting 110 million tons of man-made heat-trapping gas into that shell as if it's an open sewer. Just, right. We tell people, oh, you have millions of tons of, of uh, toxic gaseous waste, uh, harmful ga gaseous waste. Just dump it in the sky. We don't care. Uh, no charge, uh, you know, we'll b dump that on uh, the environmental Environment. externalities in future generations. So, yes, that ought to be included in the metrics by w that we use to measure the value of decisions, of, of, of the choices that we make, of course. But we're making investments. Uh, you also talked about the percentage of assets that we're investing in, the things we are creating, the capabilities we are creating that in the, in the carbon-based area that may end up being stranded, wasted, yes. have no return. That measure of stuff that we have found that we won't be able to use, it's, yeah. it's a huge uh, percentage. Yeah, a a absolutely. Uh, subprime carbon assets. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the, the language implies the analogy to the subprime mortgages, seven and a half million of them sold here in the U.S. alone uh, to people who couldn't make a down payment on their homes, much less the monthly payments. But the, the mass delusion that m many uh, uh, large banks uh, adopted was that if you lump them all together and attach a, a phony insurance-like document and sell them into the global marketplace, the risk uh, disappears. The risk is gone. And a guy here in the Bay Area, I can't remember his name, but uh, he was one of, one the, of the few yeah. who, mm -hmm. who, who peeled back the layers of the onion and said, oh my God, these things well are worked. worthless. Well worked. A and, and that realization spread rapidly and their value collapsed down to, to zero. That caused the credit crisis and in turn led to the Great Recession. Well, uh, by in that pattern, except much larger, about two-thirds of all the carbon-based assets that are already discovered and already marked to market on the books of uh, multinationals and sovereigns, about two-thirds cannot be burned, will not be will burned. Will not be burned. For a variety of reasons, demand destruction, the competition from renewables, uh, regulations and laws, uh, municipalities, regional governments, etc., not going to be burned. At what point is there a realization in the markets that the price level they're marked at now is a total illusion? Total, total illusion. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to collapse. That's one of the main reasons why for the fourth year in a row the World Economic Forum in Davos has said the climate crisis is the number one threat to the global Economy. economy number one. And, and we have to come to grips with this. And some, and some of the central bankers of the world, led by Mark Carney at the Bank of England, Mark Carney, uh, has absolutely. also identified this as a major source of risk for another financial shock. It's, a absolutely. It's, it's why Mike Bloomberg set up right. this uh, right. a, a, a panel on the, the disclosure of disclosure, climate disclosure. Re related risks, and right. Mark Carney led that. Mm -hmm. My uh, co-founder and partner at Generation Investment Management, David, David Blood, Blood, had mm -hmm. a, a laboring oar in that effort. Right. Right. Uh, and we are now beginning to see more disclosures. And by the way, the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world, in Norway, uh, announced that its intention to 100% uh, divest from yes. all... Uh, coal and oil assets, which provided, you know, 100% of their income in the first place. Uh, <laughs> right, that's why and, they and, have a fund. <laughs> and I think the number of funds that have made this commitment is now up to $5 trillion. That's amazing. Uh, and, 
investors are beginning to, 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 to move far out ahead, some investors, not all, uh, of politicians. So we, got, we have five minutes left. I got two questions, and they're not, it's not really fair, but I want, I want to tell you them and it's because they're both just, I think, so important. One is we need to say a little bit about the scenery and yeah. hurricanes yeah. because climate skeptics will say, yeah, there are always hurricanes. Why, what, why are you having hurricane pictures here? What does Hurricane Florence have to yeah. do with climate change? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, first of all, bef before we even get to the hurricanes, have there been any fires in California this year? Uh, you know, the Mendocino Complex fire was the largest fire in the history of California. Uh, that fire tornado uh, it was a half a mile across at the base and uh, 1,400 degrees, 160 mile, 140 mile an hour winds. Uh, and every year the record is broken here now, the drought and the Four Corners region. I mean, I could go through the list, but let's just talk for a second about okay. Hurricane Florence that's on the way. It is crossing a uh, part of the Atlantic Ocean where the temperature of the water is three and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal. So it has intensified at a record or near record rate. It's up to a Cat 4. They think it's going to get right, to a Category 5. Uh, and so the number of hurricanes or cyclonic storms, hurricanes, typhoons, cyclones around, they're all the same thing. They have different names in different, different names, ocean yeah. basins. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the absolute number doesn't increase, but the number of big ones increases dramatically. Okay. Uh, and one reason is, as the water is warmer, the convection energy drives the wind speeds uh, to, to much higher levels. And the warming now goes down in the ocean, 90% of the heat we're trapping every day goes, goes into, into the, the oceans, ocean. right. and it's now penetrating deeper than 2,000 meters. So hurricanes, as they approach the land, instead of churning up the cold water uh, and short-circuiting the convection energy, when the water is hot all the way to the bottom, then they just keep on building in strength. So that's, that's one okay. thing. Okay. Sea level is already higher, so the storm surge is greater. Right. And here's the other factor that you'll, we'll see play out on the news if the, if the projections by the meteorologists are, are correct. The, normally, the northern hemisphere jet stream moves weather systems across the North American continent. Mm -hmm. But as we saw with Hurricane Harvey last year in uh, Houston, Texas, uh, the jet stream has been getting much wavier and episodically disorganizing. And so we get these periods where weather systems just are locked in place for multiple days in a row. Uh, last year in, in Harris County, Texas, Harvey, which came over much warmer waters, uh, it stayed there for five days. And if you think in your mind about Niagara Falls and how giant they are, 509 days worth of the full flow of <laughs> Niagara Falls. That's what was dumped in five days on Texas and Louisiana. <laughs> and in Harris County, the, it got up the, the five feet uh, of rain. And they're talking now 30 inches uh, uh, predicted for parts of the Carolinas. Because again, if you look on the news, I mean, every night on the TV news, I say this often, is like a nature hike through the book of Revelation. Uh, and, 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 you know, often the news media doesn't connect the dots, but people are saying, whoa, this is unusual. Uh, and they're now predicting that this Hurricane Florence is not only going to be a massive hurricane and drop an enormous amount of rain, but it, that it's going to stay yeah. there yeah. for days at a yeah. time. Right. And the southeastern quadrant extending over the ocean, as Hurricane Harvey did last year, uh, continues to replenish the moisture in the storm. We got 5% more humidity in the, in the atmosphere of the Earth today than in 1980 because we're, we're disrupting the water cycle that's one of the bases of life by dramatically increasing the amount of water vapor coming off the ocean into the sky. So we get these rain bombs, uh, like the one after the fire in uh, Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara County that's last right. year. Then they got a rain bomb, right. and that, that led to the mudslide. So there are multiple factors uh, uh, underway at the same time. And, We've only mentioned a few of them. But look, at some point, we have got to collectively say, uh, 
we can't go on like this. The scientists predicted years ago what Hurricane Florence, the, the phenomena that Hurricane Florence is today. The fact that the scientists were right on almost everything they predicted about the climate crisis decades ago should cause <laughs> us to pay a little more, more attention, attention to what they're saying will happen in the future if we don't get our arms around this and start decarbonizing the global economy at a very rapid rate and embracing this sustainability revolution and creating a world that we can say to our kids and grandkids, this is the best we could do. We did not close our eyes. We did not turn away. We are awake. We are alive. We're paying attention. We're going to do the right thing. <laughs> I just want to see, you, uh, I just want to point out, you see the difference between facts-based scientific analysis and the kind of analysis we frequently hear elsewhere in some parts <laughs> of the United States. Uh, I also want to say I had the pleasure of serving as a, one of Al's economic advisors. Uh, you can see how hard it is to give advice to someone who knows so oh, damn God. much about so many things. Al, it's just fantastic. Um, let me talk a little bit about activism, your activism. Now, mm. you are active in a variety of ways. Being here is an activist event, but you have a for-profit company, Generation Investment Management, uh, and you have a very influential nonprofit climate reality project. Um, I I want to talk a little bit about uh, why you've chosen these two different routes and how they're moving the, the needle. And I, you told a wonderful story about the movement of the needle just last week on, in the California legislature for a climate reality project. But why don't you talk a little bit about those two approaches to being an activist? Okay, so um, last week, uh, was it last week or the week before? I guess it was the week before. Uh, I had a, the, the climate reality project uh, has three-day training sessions all around the world. We did one here in San Francisco mm -hmm. a few years back, and we did one in Berlin uh, uh, in June, in Mexico City in March. We're doing one in Tokyo next year, a, another, the fourth training in uh, Australia and Brisbane, um, in Atlanta next uh, March. Um, and the, the purpose is to, to distribute the, the best science-based knowledge that the scientists are, ha, have come up with uh, and to train people in what experts in communication and persuasion can teach them about how to be a grassroots advocate. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, uh, la the, two weeks ago, or 10 days ago now, um, uh, Kevin DeLeon in the uh, uh, California Senate called me up, he, he probably called everybody, but he asked me if I would write a letter to all the legislators and about SB 100 that Jerry Brown just signed, and it's, a, it's an amazing. And, um, and, and so I did, and I did some other things to try to help, as, as, as others did. So I began that Tuesday morning by telling uh, the people who came to this training, of the 2,200, 1,600 were from California, uh, and I told them we may have some good news later today because SB 100 is pending and it's a dramatic. And um, about 3 o'clock that afternoon, Senator De Leon uh, called me and said, bad news, Al, we needed 41 votes and we only got 37. Can you get on the telephone and call some of these legislators that might be persuaded to switch their votes? And I said, Kevin, I don't, I'm running this conference. Give me the names of the four legislators <laughs> <laughs> that are most vulnerable to persuasion, and he did. And I went to the podium and said, Here, here's, this, here's the deal. <laughs> <laughs> Activism in real time. <laughs> and uh, so we had a little break, and a lot of texting and telephone calling and email went on. From These 1,600 are, were already pretty committed. Now, so many <laughs> others around the state were involved. Oh, sure. I can't give oh, those sure. trainees full credit <laughs> for it. But three hours later, Kevin calls and said they, they switched their votes and the bill has passed. <laughs> so... <laughs> it's a 
It's just, but, but that's just an that's that's a, a, a an small example, example yeah. is, of the yeah. kind of thing that has to happen yeah. all over the world. All over the world. Look, our democracy has been hacked all long before the, the Russians hacked it. The big money. Uh, hacked it and corporations, but the antidote is grassroots engagement and involvement by enough people who care about the future. Register to vote. Vote. We've got to take back our country. Yep, I think that's... Sorry to get heated here. No, no, no. I I, I think that is actually a tremendous note. I think our time is up. I think it's a tremendous note on which to end. We're going to discuss, so I mentioned that you have had two major ways, or many ways, that you've expressed your activism. One is through the, the nonprofit we just talked about, which is very influential around the world. And two is really uh, starting and running and uh, a very successful for-profit for sustainability investment uh, Operation. So we'll be discussing the importance of Good. private capital. Yeah. Um, so not only go out and vote, but an important point is that more and more investors really care about using their investment dollars. In yeah, this and space. contact your your pension fund. Uh, you, you know who who's managing your four hundred one k. The the amount of money that's allocated in decisions in the private sector is a vast multiple of all the money allocated in in government budgets. Governments have to play the leading role, and I'll say that again. But the private sector, and particularly the investment sector, uh, can play a a crucial role in navigating this this shift toward uh, sustainability. Absolutely. So everybody can be involved you know, in their personal lives and in their economic lives and in their political lives. And you will hear that basically uh, a very large percentage of investors, about three quarters, uh, actually talk about sustainability as one of their criteria Mm. for investing. And among millennials, it's even higher. It's more than 80 percent. So so it's really important to note that the activism that you've demonstrated in both parts of political mobilization, making phone calls, training people to go out and do grassroots organization is also being matched by a flow of interest and dollars from private investors. And thank you for making that both of those things possible. So I think that's basically all the time we have. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was great. You're the best. You're the best.